Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. It's wonderful to see you all here today. Just a couple of announcements. First of all, I do want to greet all of those of you who are joining us via Facebook on social media as you worship with us um, virtually. And of course, if you are worshiping with us in person, do want to invite you all to sign in the little red books that you will find in your rows. Let us know a little bit about yourself if this is your first time worshiping with us so we can greet you appropriately. If you are a member of the cabinet, we are having a cabinet meeting um, immediately after worship, uh, so please do join us downstairs in the Faith Collective room. We are also having um, a reception right after worship to celebrate um, our graduate. We do have one graduate this year. We're congratulating Joss Raffi today, so uh, that will be fun. We are also blessing our backpacks. If you are an educator, if you are a retired educator, uh, if you are a student, a retired student, uh, however that works for you all, um, uh, please do bring your backpack up here and we will have a special time uh, to celebrate with you all. I also do bring greetings from 3,000 of your closest friends uh, who gathered for the General Assembly of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Louisville this uh, last week, and so they uh, they all send greetings. There was a lot of work done this week, and you will uh, be hearing more about that uh, in the coming days about the assembly. We are beginning a new sermon series today where we're going to be digging into some of the scriptures from Genesis, and we are going to be putting those in conversations with uh, practical theologian um, Kate Bowler, who teaches at Duke University Divinity School. So. I invite you to join us in a conversation today on aging, which is something everybody experiences, whether you like it or not, or whether you know it or not, you experience that. So I want to invite you all to come with your whole selves, all that God created you to be, as we sit and listen to that still small voice that calls to us and welcomes us into the presence of the Holy on this day.
Good morning. Good morning. Please rise and join us in the call to worship and remain standing through our opening hymn. In the beginning. In the beginning. We were not there in the beginning. Some stories are long, some are short. But God's story, God's creation is very good. Please join us in the opening hymn, Morning Has Broken, found on page 53 of the hymnal. glad to see that so many of you braved the weary weather and uh, could overcome your snooze alarm. This morning we share in joys and concerns as does the body of the church. We pray for Jean Blackburn who had COVID last week and is ended up in the ER this weekend with um, some other complicating things. Uh, we will keep you posted as we know more. We also pray for Dick Sharp, who was hospitalized this week for some of his ongoing health issues. He is still in the hospital. I'm happy to report that Bryce Wynn went home this week um, and reported that he felt so supported by hearing from so many of you. So well done, church. And then finally, we pray this day for teachers, principals, school staff, and students who go back to school and also hold the few that uh, have a few more weeks of summer. We are going to be led in a new song. Ismael is going to sing it for, uh, with, he's going to teach it to us. Lana is going to teach it. Um, and then we will join in. We will use this song for the month of August. So it's okay if it doesn't feel comfortable yet, it will certainly get that. Thank you. 
bring to you the dreams that we are too scared to write down. We find comfort in you, knowing that We also bring to you the smaller concerns, the worries that keep us awake at night, the things that only we know. We bring to you our big worries about health and happiness, security and safety for us and our loved ones. We bring big worries about the world that we live in and its future existence. We bring big worries about the ways people in our treated as less than human, exploited and abused. O God of understanding, comfort those of us for whom the future brings fears and uncertainties. Assure us that you are with us all, even when the future seems unclear. Remind us that you are able to transform even the bleakest of situations, bringing healing and wholeness. Help us amidst our worry and uncertainty to pursue a world of justice. All of our dreams and plans we give to you now, O oh God. God of all creation, take our plans that we lift up and refine them, redirect them, interrupt them. Reveal to us your promises in our dreams and give us the ability to pursue your dream for this world that you still love. We pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ with the prayer he taught us saying, our creator who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's time for what is one of my favorite things that we do as a church every year, and that is the blessing of the backpacks. So I want to invite all of you all who are students, all of you all who are educators, retired educators, to come uh, up front now. And while we're doing that, I want to make sure that you all uh, all know that we have welcomed Dr. Jim Davis uh, here this morning. It's so wonderful to have Jim with us. A life of faith and devotion so well lived, it's always so wonderful to have your witness and your presence here with us. So thanks be to God. All right, friends, today you see before us backpacks. Backpacks that will be filled to the brim with books. Some days, those backpacks are going to be too heavy to carry. These are backpacks that will, on other days, be empty and lazily drug along the ground. These are backpacks that will be tossed into lockers, slammed onto the floor, packed and unpacked day after day during this new school year. But no matter how these backpacks are used, every day they represent the work that is asked of our children. They represent their struggles and their victories. And as in every aspect of, of our life, we bring these things before God for blessing at this time. And today, oh, come on up. Today, we also have our educators before us, people who have dedicated their lives to children, 
learners, thinkers, dreamers, and doers. So we welcome these men and women who bring order to chaos, who bring love where so often there is none. Women and men who will laugh and smile with joy and whose hearts will break sometime on the very same day. We bring you, children of God, who love, nurture, encourage, and stretch our children. We bring you all before God for blessing at this time, too. So, friends, I invite you all to pray. Let us pray. Holy One, we bring before you these students. They stand here, part of your beautiful creation, ready to learn, ready for the adventure of a new school year. We ask that you be present with them. We bring before you these backpacks. May they be daily reminders of the congregation that prays for these students, for the love that envelops them, for the support they deserve every day, no matter what. And of course, gracious God, we bring before you the teachers, administrators, caregivers, cooks, cleaners, and parents, all who come together to support these children. May they know your hope and your grace. May they be reminded that this congregation embraces their call to teaching and learning and surrounds them with love and care as well. This we pray in the name of the one who came as a child and became a teacher to us all, the one we call the Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Everybody except Josh. So we are also excited to celebrate both the high school graduation of, of Josh Raffi and the fact that he is heading off to Virginia Tech in just a couple of days, right? So yeah, we know that there's a, there's a, a car that's going to be full of all of the stuff to fill his dorm room that's going to be heading to Blacksburg, and we're just very, so, very excited for you and for your family and for this new adventure for you. We do have a, a little bit of something to maybe help pay for, pay for books, only books. <laughs> And, uh, and we will have a, a, a study Bible that, uh, I don't know if there's like a special Santa Claus for study Bibles, but he's been delayed, so we will, we will have that for you. But Joss, we pray that God's blessing will be upon you as you go into this, this new chapter. We wish you the best, and we pray that God's face will shine upon you and that you will be blessed and kept in this next chapter. And we, we thank you for being who you are, and we're so excited for who you're going to become, even more of the Joss that we love so dearly. Thank you, and congratulations. Our scripture today comes from the beginning of Genesis. And this is, if you know the book of Genesis,
I wasn't worried about that. But now in my 40s, and because I have a spouse who wants to keep me healthy, I wear these incredibly fashionable socks <laughs> these days. And that, in many ways, is the story of aging, right? Our bodies do different things, need different things than they did a decade ago or even a couple of years ago. We see things differently, we do things differently, we have different limits that we haven't always had, and we have to make choices based on those changes. Perhaps you felt this in a different way. Perhaps you're looking retirement in the mirror and you have lots of vigor, lots of energy, and lots of interest in contributing, but you're not sure what your next act is gonna be. Or perhaps it just seems like yesterday when you brought a baby home from the hospital and now you are looking at leaving that baby in a dorm room in Blacksburg and you are not looking forward to the tears on the way home. <laughs> Aging is one of those things that we sort of prepare for, but we're never quite prepared for, right? And yet, it happens. I planned this sermon a few months ago after a pastoral visit with Jim and Mary Davis. Mary, as many of you know, was one of those people who aged incredibly gracefully. She was an incredible hostess, always ready to welcome people into her home, full of life and always ready to celebrate. And then one day that changed. She fell. And she suffered a couple of pretty serious breaks. And her body never quite seemed to heal. And then there was a pandemic that never quite seemed to end. And so on a visit to Jim and Mary, where she served Allison and me McDonald's frappes, the only thing sweeter in that house than her, she said, Brandon, this aging thing is not for wimps. All of those dinner parties I used to attend have been replaced by doctor's appointments. And you know what? It's hard. You should preach a sermon on this. And so, months ago, I planned this sermon and was going to give her a call, and then life and change and death. And so I wanted to share with you some of the things that I thought about that I wanted to share with Mary. And it is fitting that we said goodbye to Mary this week. And it is fitting that we welcome our dear Jim back today so we can have this sort of conversation. Now, at the root of Mary's question is the theological question that comes up when we read this scripture in Genesis. Everything that God made was what? Good. And if everything is good, why does my back ache? Why does my memory not do what it used to do? Why have I outlasted my dearly beloved friends? And why everything is good, does aging and life just sometimes hurt? Aging is not for wimps, but aging is for all of us. Now, to be honest, the Christian tradition has not done a good job with kind of thinking through aging. And you really can't blame the first century church all that much for that. After all, they thought the kingdom of God was imminent. It was coming any day. So why would you spend a whole lot of time thinking about aging in that first century? Now, as the church matured and started to kind of think through its theology, you get sometimes some problematic ways that, that early Christian theologians thought about aging. 
After all, in that second creation story about Adam and Eve, one of the predominant ways that we interpret that story is it's a story about the fall of humanity. And death was a consequence of sin. So what is aging, actually, but just kind of that road to death that was a consequence of sin? So at the very best, it became kind of awkward to think about aging or taboo. At the very worst, it became something that was thought of in a negative sort of way. On the other hand, you know, one of the ways that Christianity has often thought about aging sort of defaults to what we inherit from the Hebrew Bible. Lots of respect for our elders, right? Wisdom comes with aging. And so while we spent a lot of time kind of propping that up, saying that as we age, we gain wisdom, we also didn't spend a lot of time collecting wisdom about what it means to age. Over the last couple of centuries, there has been thinking both among theologians, philosophers, social scientists, medical ethicists around aging. You have a whole kind of profession that's emerged around it and field of study called gerontology, and you can, you can study what it means to age. I actually took a, a course in, in college, uh, Hiram College, where I went, had this pretty innovative program um, on, that brought the humanities and medicine together. And so we had these sort of interdisciplinary courses. I took one that was taught by two medical ethicists from a, a nearby med school and an English professor who also had a master's degree in bioethics. And it was a course on literature and aging. So you have you know, three folks who are talking about medical ethics with a bunch of 20-somethings on aging, the perfect audience, right, to think through these issues. And we read all of these essays and poems and short stories, so you got to see what, like, Alice Walker and Saul Bellow and all of these really important 19th and 20th century writers were thinking about aging and talking about it, discussing and kind of coming up with your own theories on this. And, and I just remember, you know, this medical ethicist who taught at a med school as we brought these questions that were impossible to kind of answer, just kind of threw up his hands in the middle of class and said, well, you know, like, really, aging is just kind of a mystery, man. I really could not imagine telling Mary Davis, well, you know, aging is just a mystery, man, and <laughs> leaving it at that. And that's why I'm so grateful for the work of our conversation partner, Kate Bowler, on this. Now, the book that we have been reading is a collection of blessings, poetic blessings, like the one that I read to begin the sermon, where she talks about the limits of the cliches that we often live with as religious folks. I mean, how often have you heard one of those, well, you know, everything works for the good, which she tackles in the blessing that we heard this morning. Everything happens for what? A reason? Does your heartbreak happen for a reason? Is God happy with your heartbreak? That's the sort of inquiry that these blessings that she offers ask. And she comes by that honestly. Kate Bowler has lived with chronic forms of cancer most of her life. She's in her late 30s and doesn't remember a day in her adult life when she wasn't sick. And so that has brought these real questions to the front of her mind. The questions of how we deal with suffering in the midst of it. And so you might ask, why would someone with such a pragmatic perhaps even cynical, or at least stoic, understanding of life, why would she write a book of blessings? If you're on any sort of social media, you might have seen that hashtag bless, where there's usually like somebody at a really nice looking pool with something that they want to sell you, and they're telling you how incredible their life is, and how lovely and wealthy they are, and there's that hashtag after it, that they are what? Blessed. Well, Bowler tells us that in the biblical tradition, 
Blessed is not about having a bunch of stuff. A blessing, she says, and she follows Stephen Chapman, an Old Testament scholar who also teaches at Duke Divinity School in thinking through this, that the human act of blessing, that saying something is blessed, that saying that you are blessed or to offer a blessing to someone is this. It's a means of placing oneself and others, placing your community, placing the people that you love, placing the people you pray for within God's good creation. It means you name that God is good and you say you are a part of God's goodness. For all of the garbage in your life, you are part of God's good creation. And that means that to bless someone is to invite them to participate in God's ongoing work of creation in the entire world. And by blessing, you affirm that God is in relationship with that person. No matter how hard life is, God is with you. Kate Bowler says that she thinks about it this way. That when she prays as someone who is living with chronic illness, her prayer is, God, save me, save me, save me. But if you don't, love me through. That's the gospel right there. The Gospel of John begins with what we might call a midrash, that's sort of a story written to interpret a story on that first creation story in Genesis. In the beginning, just like how Genesis begins, John says, in the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word did what? It came and dwelt. It tabernacled. It lived among us. God is with us from the creation we don't even remember and loves us through all of the heartbreak. And even though Mary Davis was asking me Here's the thing. Mary Davis lived out that answer. When you walked into Mary's home, she was there, dressed to the nines, a little too much gold on. I hear that she blasted El Divo, that Italian trio, to the top of its lungs in her house. And there was not a cook compare with her as she welcomed you to the table. And on my last visit to Mary, when she was in a hospital bed, barely conscious, she turned to me and she offered an embrace, a welcome, reminiscent of the welcome I received every time I saw her. She knew that her job as a disciple, as part of the church, was to love people through whatever, just like God does. As we age, as we round the corner to the next chapter, as we look toward the unknown. God loves us through it. And there is no better news than that. Thanks be to God.
the way the church brings beauty into a fragmented world through music, through poetry, we give thanks. Thank you all so much for sharing your gifts with us. The peace of Christ be with you. It is a table of hospitality that we come to, a place where we are welcome no matter the life we live, no matter the life we hoped to live no matter the lives we actually live despite our plans and hopes. Christ welcomes all to this table, full stop. There are no conditions on that welcome. This is Christ's table and you are welcome. At First Christian Church, we do practice open communion no matter your tradition, no matter where you are in your journey on life, you are welcome here. We also practice communion by intinction, which means that in a minute you will be invited to come, beginning at the back of the sanctuary, to come forward, break off a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and receive a blessing from the elder who serves you. We also have special hygiene uh, cups of communion that you can take. There are gluten-free options and we also have a tradition of offering grape juice instead of wine, which is inclusive of those who struggle with alcohol and alcoholism as well. If you would like to support the ministries of First Christian Church, you are also welcome to offer a gift as you come down the aisle, and we will put that to the use of ministry in this community. All are invited, friends, and all means all. And because of all being invited to the table, all of you are welcome to join in the litany that you will find printed in the bulletin. And the table will be wide. And the welcome will be wide. And the arms will open wide to gather us in. And our hearts will open wide to receive. And we will come as children who trust that there is enough. We will come, come unhindered and free. And our, and our aching will be met with bread. bread. And our sorrow will be met with harm.
friends I pass on to you. It's been handed down to me. On that night when Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his friends, his disciples, men and women who had worked with him, had eaten with him thousands of times, it must have felt like. But on that night, he took a loaf of bread. He blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my very body, broken for you. In the same way, after they had eaten, he shared a cup with them as well, saying, this is the cup of a new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Every time you gather together, every time you share this meal, do so in remembrance of me. Loving God, when your children are lost and alone, you guide us. When your children are hungry, you feed us. Thank you for sustaining us when we are in need. The feast that we now celebrate is a symbol of your grace and kindness. Thank you for the gifts of bread and wine. As we share these gifts, we remember the greatest gift of all, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Touch our lives with holiness so that we, in living, reflect your love. In Christ's name, amen. All are welcome at this table, and if you are not able to make the journey down the aisle, communion can be served to you where you sit. But friends, all are invited. The feast is prepared. Come to the feast.
Tapan, tapan. Okay. We bless these offerings and pray that they will be used to do your work in this church and in our community, to draw the circle wide and wider still. We thank you for the gift of Christian unity, of coming together to this table as a congregation to share the bread and cup, for the gift of having a community woven together by Christ's love, a tapestry of relationships that bind us to each other. May it ever be so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, we have gathered together. We have celebrated our students and educators. We have heard from ancient scriptures. We have come together at the table. If this is the sort of place that you are looking for, the sort of church community that appeals to you, a place where we do our best to practice what we preach, to gather together as a community of hope, I invite you to talk to Reverend Allison or myself or to any of our elders. I promise you don't have to have red hair to join this church. <laughs> it may help. <laughs> But friends, I invite you to come along with us as a community and do talk to us if you want to be part of the spiritual journey that we share together as a community of faith. And now, friends, I invite you to stand and sing our closing hymn. It's printed in our bulletin, or you'll find it on num uh, number 651 in your hymnal, God Who Stretched the Spangled Heavens. Let us stand and sing the first, second, and fourth verses. Let us sing with hope and with joy. <laughs> couple of things before we go out into the world. Uh, children are invited to uh, meet with Reverend Allison just outside of the sanctuary before they head out. And don't forget, there is cake. We are going to be celebrating Joss's graduation, so please do join us for a cake in the reception. Save me a corner piece, but please do enjoy <laughs> all of the cake that is there. And friends, as you go, remember this. In the beginning, there was God, and what God created was good. And when God created you, God created you good enough to meet the challenges that feel overwhelming, to heal the heartbreak in your community, 
in your family. God created you in love, and God created you as something, as someone who is indeed very, very good. Thanks be to God.